We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Welcome to the, this workshop of the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Standards, Security and Safety. And it's actually our first university, we, uh, an anniversary, sorry, that we uh, established ourselves last year at the virtual IGF. I would say in Poland, but of course it was on, on the internet. And um, in, in that year, we've progressed tremendously, which we will be presenting on here later. But for those who are not really familiar with this dynamic coalition, let me give a short introduction before we go into the topics we've been working on and will work on in 2022. This dynamic coalition has a very clear goal, is to make the internet more secure and safer. And that we want to approach that from a very specific angle, and that is the deployment of currently existing security related internet standards and ICT best practices. So just to give a few examples of what we're talking about, when there is a domain name system, you get a domain name, but if you do not sign it, it is insecure. So DNSSEC security is an example. When you have a website, usually it's created insecure, but there are best practices called the OWASP top 10 that when one deployed, secure your website from all sorts of attacks. When you develop software, you could do that according to securing software principles or just not test anything and have insecure software with a lot of flaws in them and with the internet of things you can create them with security designed inside or without we are talking about the sort of best practices and existing internet standards that need to be deployed better to secure our society and our personal lives in a better way what I've been hearing in these past years a lot, but there will be so much opposition against you because there will be a lot of countries will not be interested to discuss this, this topic and not just countries, but also organizations. And I put one question to them. Do you want to be hacked? And I think that for 100%, no matter who you are on this world and live in this world, the answer is no, nobody wants to be hacked. So we have a common feature in common with each other, that we want to be secure and safe from attack from the outside. Now on the in and around the internet, it is usual to work with mitigation. There's an incident, people start running around it and solve it, and then it's, fi it's fixed. The perpetrator is outside or we thrown away a computer. But what was the cause of that incident? And that is something which is not always looked into enough. So what we are moving towards with our dynamic coalition is to look more at the prevention. So if all these services and devices and internet tools come better prepared security wise to the end user and to the people creating these, these these uh, tools, it would mean that we would be much more secure. So that means that with perhaps 70 to 80% of all attack factors closed for the bad guys. So in other words, that would be working towards prevention. And at this current moment, there's a huge gap, a gap between the theory of cybersecurity and the daily practice, which is quite often insecure. And that's the gap that this dynamic coalition is trying to close as much as possible. That will mean leaving silos. But already said with the DNSSEC, that's domain name world. They always talk about the, the domain name security. When you go to the internet resource organizations, they will be talking about secure routing, making sure that the transport is more secure. With websites, they will only be talking about OWASP. 
But when I'm buying the product, when I buy a new laptop, only the Lord, I hope, knows whether the thing is secure and whether everything works as it's supposed to work security-wise. As a normal consumer, there's no way of going there. And when you're a procurement officer in a large organization, it's not just DNSSEC or RPKI you're faced with, you're perhaps faced with a million different standards. And where do you start? And that is something that we have to get our, our brain around, how to help these people that actually procure this software, these devices, these tools, these services, to buy them more secure for their organizations. And we have to do that because the effect of insecurity on our societies is becoming devastating. If you, if you count up all the numbers and the, the loss in money, from not only from to the bad guys, the losses to the bad guys, but also the losses in a much societal broad way are basically devastating and only seem to be getting worse. So there is a time for action. And we think that the time has been way past this hour. So where are we with this dynamic coalition? And my colleagues here around me and on the internet will give you a presentation. We established three working groups last year. The first working group is on security by design and a subgroup on internet of things. So that means there could be other topics in the future. The second world group is on education and skills and is about the gap between what the, our students leaving, whether vocational training or university class and courses and the, the demand that the society and industry has, and there seems to be a huge gap between them. And we have plans how to address that gap in the future. The third working group is on procurement, supply chain management, and the creation of a business case for security. And we have a fourth working group since two, two months, and that is on professionalizing our communication, which is a bit different from the other topics because this is more on, on the procedure of our, uh, of our uh, dynamic coalition. And we will be changing our name, we've decided on, and that will be announced by the chair of this working group. So there's a bit of a cliffhanger here as well. Um, we've done a lot of internal government governance where we will be talking about a little bit and a little bit about all the outreach that we've done. After that, there is an opportunity for questions from online and here in the room. And after that, I will wrap up and tell a little bit about what we'll be trying to do in 2022, working towards the next IGF. With this, I'm closing my, uh, my introduction nicely in time, I see. So that's a good stimulus to, uh, to the others speaking. Um, I'm just turning to you, Savio, which you, uh, Yuri is presenting, I suppose, yes? Yes. So you, Yuri, I hope that you are there because I can't, can't only see Mark. Hi, Mark. But uh, Yuri, the floor is yours and the next 10 minutes are, are for you. So please, Yuri, present on Working Group 1 on IoT Security by Design. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Wood. Um, I am Yuri Kargopolov and uh, Chairman of uh, Working Group Number 1. Uh, the starting point uh, was our uh, group was defined by the tasks of defining the decision making and the uh, disc uh, discussion rules, uh, key time frames, and the subjects area in which uh, our uh, working group uh, will work. These items are reflected in our mission state, uh, statement. One another uh, starting point was will be proposed of the working hypothesis about which factors uh, are the most problematic, problematic in solving security and safety issues. Namely, uh, the first is gaps in the architecture of IoT. The second one, the competing protocols, uh, <clears throat> diversity of protocols. The three is uh, three points is it. Uh, third point, sorry, uh, poor or deficient security specifications, lack of the identifi identification manager or management of <laughs> identity management. And uh, uh, the fifth is a need of the basic trust model. In any case, the main uh, working uh, paradigm 
uh, was defined it as a security by design. And uh, we <clears throat> so also determined such a coordinate system of assessing and uh, assessing an existing situation that uh, will have given the opportunity to assess the degree of readiness of existing technical, technological, administrative, and other solutions affecting, um, affecting to decision to design system with building security uh, by default. Why is the thesis of uh, building a security by default important? This was another starting point for our work. We understand the, that the experience of analysis, analyzing and processing the <clears throat> protection result, uh, results uh, of both systems and single uh, digital entities is the experience of a reactive uh, uh, character. They must find a way to place mechanism as close as possible to the digital entity to be protected not only to ensure security and safety against existing threats, but also to find solutions for predicting new threats. Uh, envisioning to face the challenge of keeping safety and security within the internet with the, uh, uh, with the increasing role uh, of internet of things devices. The working group on IoT security by design has the aim of analyzing and researching the gap between the theory and the practice of cybersecurity standards and best practice regarding the designing and maintenance of IoT systems. This work should include both scenarios, updating existing solution and creating from scratch. In this sense, uh, working group called for the attention of uh, diverse experts uh, uh, experts in the area in different area and uh, join several members during the first year of our activities the working group has also established good relationships with other stakeholders community uh, communities uh, uh, here we can mention the expertise and research exchange between the uh, activities of our working group and the IoT cybersecurity Latin America and Caribbean working group, for example, which is developing a relevant work of mapping national initiative regarding certification, homologization, and regulation of the commercialization of IoT devices in the region, <clears throat> above region mentioned. Another organization, we are building a collaboration platform with the ISOC uh, and IoT Special Interest Group, ITC, as well as through platform of national and regional IJS2. The mission statement uh, was also developed in June, uh, the current year, based on the open uh, consultations. So this document summarizes the uh, working group problem, challenges, and opportunities the possible solutions and outcomes uh, and finally can be used as a reference for new members and the reference book uh, like manual uh, for new members and uh, the future working group activities. During the first um, semester of uh, 2022, 2021, sorry, uh, working group has um, uh, fulfilled the work related to the analysis of uh, researching materials and proceeded to the preparation of final documents, including recommendations and guidelines. In addition, where in addition, where hypothesis that uh, various stakeholders can uh, perceive the architecture and the importance of trees in different ways. For example, academic circles may have other perceptions when user of even suppliers. User groups may, uh, may also have different uh, preferences regarding uh, treat protections. As a result, it was proposed to develop and conduct a survey for various group of stakeholders and obtain additional information. In fact, as we are filled more directly with the different stakeholders of the markets of different countries uh, where are involved in the design and operations of IoT system and facing security issues. 
Our community service uh, was carried during the uh, whole month of October, containing 11 questions about uh, the respondents background with their concern, concerns regarding IoT security by design, the preferred type of policies to solve their issues, and asking about um, the organization success, successful initiatives. In total, the survey collected uh, 67 responses, where most of them came from academia, 25 uh, persons, technical community, 25 persons, and private sector, 16 persons. Geographically, we are well distributed between uh, all continents, but, but Latin America and Caribbean show a significantly lower representations. The detailed result will be presented in the uh, uh, general DC report uh, later. Some of the unresolved uh, challenges that we more mentioned it in our survey answer and uh, listed below. For example, lack of proper security, also the <clears throat> legacy devices, the lack of regulation, for example, in terms of liability and procurement, uh, lacking data security, improver uh, awareness uh, education, lack of standards, missing interoperability, uh, unsufficient capacity building. Uh, working group decided by the process by the, uh, to use it the, in the analysis. Therefore, the process will run in the free general step. Uh, it's concern uh, collect collated uh, uh, standards and collated um, uh, best practice uh, and collated uh, documents uh, regarding uh, from from uh, documents from. Uh, many countries, many, um, many systems uh, uh, from uh, uh, regarding uh, to IoT security. Step one uh, is collected based information from the documents regarding by answering quest points. First, provide a brief summary of the initiatives, including key scope and goals. Uh, which are the best practice standards or opportunities proposed by the document? What risk or challenges were mentioned by the documents? Specify the lags or you could identify in the scope of their initiatives aims to work. Are there further comments that are valid to mention? Step second is to categorize uh, these documents outputs uh, and this might have a table set is output so it's uh, it's uh, uh it's our future work and uh, our our <clears throat> structure of future work on the uh this set of document analyze analyze step sets three is analyze, compile, and organize the collected information in the, the in the discourse, uh, uh, documents. Step four, use the learning from uh, step number three to build a document output that addresses the main concern races in the community survey. About roadmap, our <clears throat> future roadmap on uh, 2022. For the coming uh, 22 year, the working group efforts uh, will be focused on outreach more members and other related communities. As I mentioned before, uh, as I mentioned before, we still have low diversity in uh, aspects of uh, gender. I missed this <laughs> before uh, this focus, but it's really diversity, low diversity, and. Uh, we inviting more women to our group might be uh, it's one day uh, of main focus for the next year organizational focus i mean for the next year among the problem uh, the membership size uh, i try uh, i'm finished thank you okay <laughs> Exactly in time, uh, Yuri. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yuri is calling in from the Ukraine, and his vice chair, Savio Vinicius de Moraes, is sitting next to me, and he's from Brazil. 
And the next lady who is going to present on uh, the lady who's going to present on uh, working group two education and skills is Janice Richardson. She's from Australia, living all over Europe, basically, I understand almost. But it shows the diversity that we do have as Mallory will present on working group three is from the US and the chair of working group two and four is from Africa. So Janice, please, uh, the floor is yours and the working group two on education and skills and their plans and what they've produced this year. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have a very long background in education, but also in working on cybersecurity with Kaspersky, Enisa, Liberty Global, and many others. Our working group focuses on education, and very rapidly we saw that there is a huge gap with the skills, the knowledge that young people are coming out of their vocational training with and the expectations of industry. And therefore, we decided to detect that gap, figure out what's missing in order to try and, and close the gap between supply and demand. We've begun this with interviews. Uh, we've already interviewed almost a dozen people, but mainly across Europe. And this is why we're reaching out to you in the hope that you will help us with these interviews. We feel that interviews with companies is very important first to see what the demand is. But at each step, we're going back to tertiary education and validating uh, the points that we're picking up. So basically, what is our work plan for the year? Well, scoping the challenge, as I've just said, we set up the interview protocol. We're liaising with industry, the education sector. We're already gathering data on the skill gaps and we will very shortly start working on a survey. We know that when once we've interviewed industry, we've interviewed tertiary establishments, then we need to create a survey so that we can start getting some qualitative data on top of the quantitative, uh, sorry, quantitative on top of the qualitative that we have already. But, we have realized that this is a huge undertaking and we can't keep working on a voluntary basis. So one of our next steps will be to reach out to try and find funding to do a really in-depth study on this. And once again, if any of you are university students and like to help us take this on, we would be most grateful. I think probably what interests you, are what sort of gaps are we finding? I'll give you a little glimpse so that you'll be eager to come and look at our website and find out more. First of all, we're very surprised to see that it's actually the soft skills that are missing, the soft skills that kids should be learning in schools. Amongst them, for example, analysis, synthesis, the capacity to see granularity, forecasting, being able to write snappy reports, being a good verbal communicator, reporting, alerting, convincing, because what we do know is in companies, it's the employees who are often the weak chain. And unless those people looking after the security are able to go out and show them the importance of what they're doing, that weak chain will continue. But the next is thinking, and this really needs to be developed from a very early age. Critical thinking is missing. Holistic thinking, problem solving, being able to join the dots and see the connections between things. Also being able to forecast and visualize results and handling complexity because those who are involved in the area of cybersecurity know that it is extremely complex. Many different parts that need to be joined together to see the overall picture. These in fact, are very important skills in monitoring. And it seems that monitoring is really one of the areas where simply there are not enough employees. But approach is also very important. Companies find that young people lack initiative, they lack agility, flexibility, 
open-mindedness, respect of diversity. And I know that Yuri already spoke about this. One person that we uh, interviewed in the Netherlands in charge of the very complex health system of the government pointed out that women see the granularity. And yet when they go into meetings, the men sort of scoff and make fun of them. So it's pushing women out of this area where that, that granularity that a woman can bring is very important. On terms, in terms of hard skills, and once again, interesting, Young people are missing the system logic. They're missing an understanding of cloud technology, operating systems, network protocol, also the internet backbone. And this is why some of the companies we've interviewed are actually are turning to hackers because they feel that they have this basic understanding that young people don't have when they believe they're qualified and come out of the tertiary education system and try and get a job. System architecture, but also business and project management. In terms of skills, even the scripting, coding, and transversal skills are missing. And companies are looking for a strategic constructivist approach. They're looking for young people who are actually able to break down those silos and able to build bridges, but they also need young people who have a really great ethical understanding and who can join the dots between the political, the technical and the legal mindset. So what have we discovered so far? Because I think that this is what's interesting. What are those good practices around Europe that could be replicated? We know that building bridges is important. And Denmark, for example, has created a national cyber hub where they bring in the tertiary sector with the vocational training. They bring in companies where they compare the results. Strategy development forums is another tactic being used in Belgium. Uh, one company, uh, one country is, uh, has a cyber academy to actually have on the job training, but not quite like the traineeships that we know so far, actually on the job training where the young people are doing concrete things and bringing that very important innovation into the world of cybersecurity. Another company is using social engineering to make sure that they can very quickly see who these young can candidates are and if they can be trained. So, what are we planning to do next? Well, as I said, we want to do an in-depth study. Therefore, we need to do more interviews. We need more people ready to carry out these interviews for us. The survey, we need your contacts so that it can really be an effective qualitative survey. We'll be then comparing findings with work group one and work group three. And we hope by around May next year, we will bring out a report which clearly shows what is missing, what we can do about it, and what of those, some of those good practices that could actually be replicated so that this talent pipeline that we should be getting from universities and uh, vocational training establishments really can uh, jumpstart into industry and start making the difference that we want. I'll hand it back to you, Walt, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Janice. And that makes me realize that I forgot to introduce myself as usual. <laughs> but uh, my name is Walt and Atris, and, and I always forget uh, saying that. Um, because I think that the, the topic is more important than, than I am. But that's basically the reason, I think. Um, to take one minute, I was having a lunch, coincidentally, with an American professor, and he said it just started two years ago, uh, cybersecurity education training in Atlanta, and that he has a course on three levels. So not just the cybersecurity, as we understand it, in a regular way. There's a second layer which is national cybersecurity, so that they learn to look beyond just the, the work that they're doing. 
And there's a third level, internet governance. So that actually the, the whole internet architecture, the, the internet governance organizations are all part of their training. So I think that would be very interesting to talk with Milton Mueller uh, pretty soon, Jen. So I will introduce the two of you I already promised. So that was my half minute in between. Um, I'm going to introduce Mallory Nodal to you. She is the chair of working group three on procurement supply chain management and uh, the creating of the business case for industry, because that's what we're talking about, the positive stimulus for industry to adopt cybersecurity. You have a phone, uh, microphone? Thanks a lot. Um, hi, so thanks very much for the intro. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about my work so you can put it in context. I also uh, am the chief technologist at the Center for Democracy and Technology based in Washington, DC. And I um, am active in the technical community. We engage in the World Wide Web Consortium and the Internet Engineering Task Force. So um, I can certainly give you a firsthand view that it's not that there are large gaps in considerations about security at the technical level. Um, we're trying to bridge the gap between where the standards are being set and then how that gets actually to the end user. So there are, my colleagues have also talked about how they're filling gaps. I think the one that we're trying to fill in um, the procurement working group is more around implementation. So you'll often hear, at least I hear it often in the technical community that standard setting is not going to police. They're not the standards police. They're not going to set standards and then absolutely make sure that they get um, into products. Um, there's a sort of, there are other incentives that have to be um, put into place to make sure that um, the products actually then reach people and the implementations are good. Um, and that's very much driven by, um, by companies. And then furthermore, on another abstraction layer that's driven by demand for those. So we have to take into account this whole, um, this whole ecosystem. And it is, you know, we are at the internet governance forum, right? Like we are essentially managing the internet from a very high level. So when we think about what kinds of inputs or influence this dynamic coalition can have, um, I think about that a lot. I'm thinking about, you know, how can we have um, some really specific impacts at a high enough level that that um, um, makes the biggest difference for the most people. Um, and so with um, that in mind, um, really this year, we've not done much more than um, come up with a research plan for this piece of work. Um, and I would just take a pause here and make it all very clear that I want as many of you that are interested in this topic as possible to participate in this research as it moves forward, even um, to some degree taking leadership positions because as dynamic coalitions go, um, it's not just about outputs, it's also um, about building um, you know, a group that works together, that practices together, that researches together, and that goes out and has influence um, in making sure that research lands in the right place. So that's uh, sort of been also top of mind is um, this year, we've very carefully laid out a plan um, for what that, uh, for what this work looks like, um, and would be open to your thoughts even today on if you think this plan is a good idea or not um, to try to fill this gap in procurement. So um, without further ado, I wanna just try to get into the theory of change. I mean, I've talked a little bit about the theory of change, right? That, that you know, if we can um, sort of understand um, what are the gaps, then I think we can better fill them. Um, and so um, it's, um, let me just go through, I think how we're going to build this out. Um, Sorry, I've made this plan long enough ago. <laughs> I have to check my notes. Um, so, right, our main outcome, yeah, is we're trying to meet the global internet security standards um, in a ubiquitous baseline requirement for any public or private sector procurement and supply chain management policy. So that is pretty narrow in scope in terms of, um, you know, making the internet safer, <laughs> trying to get really specific here, but it's also achievable. I think that's a nice um, thing about having a really clear outcome. The objectives then within that um, is, are to, to fully scope the security standards and procurement challenges and opportunities. So that's the first step is to know what is already happening, um, who's working on that, and um, also 
the nice thing about a very thorough scope is that we find out who we might invite to join um, the dynamic coalition and um, essentially come along with us as we try to solve this problem together. The second objective is to figure out then obviously what is relevant and actionable guidance um, that would require um, security standards in procurement and supply chain management policies. So making sure that whatever we suggest is actually going to be useful. Um, and then of course, the last objective is that those that guidance, um, those suggestions actually influence public and private sector procurement and supply chain management. Um, those are all separate, three separate objectives that take a concerted amount of effort, but they are interrelated and, um, but for the most part, fairly linear. Um, so I don't think I've really been talking that much, but for that long, but I also don't wanna just read you these different activities. I think within each of those objectives, we've laid out a series of activities. So, you know, what many of you I'm sure are familiar with, you know, sort of basic desk research for scoping and mapping exercise. Um, we have the benefit of being part of the Internet Governance Forum, where much of this work is discussed and brought forward. You know, if you're working on an intergovernmental um, strategy for improving cybersecurity, like you're probably going to wind up talking about it at the Internet Governance Forum and, um, you know, we'll be able to talk to you and meet you and understand your challenges and so on. And um, so there's no shortage of experts as part of this group. Um, my goal always in doing sort of coalition or group led work um, is to make the work as relevant as possible, because that's how you get the most people involved. If you're doing good, interesting work that fills a gap, um, then your audience um, essentially um, makes itself. So that's the main part. That's the, that, that's the essence essentially of our first um, objective, which is to do a scoping and mapping. It shouldn't take the entire year though. Like we've sort of burned a year already, just sort of thinking about how to get this done. I'm really satisfied with the way we've laid it out, but then I think we ought to um, set a goal of getting um, that scoping wrapped up in the first half of the year. So intersessional work in the IGF can be um, deceptively open and breezy, but then, you know, December, 2022 is just around the corner. <laughs> I've learned, right? So, you know, we, we, we have to, um, we have to set some firm goals and then it becomes, you know, once we've got the scoping and mapping, I'm sure it would be, it'll be a mix of, it'll be a sort of um, mixed methods where we're doing, re we're doing desk research, but we're also um, conducting some qualitative, um, getting really to the heart of um, the second objective, which is what would be relevant and actionable. What does the internet governance forum provide um, in terms of a value proposition for folks um, to, to, to take the guidance, to listen to the guidance, um, um, and what, what kinds of guidance would that be? So it could be, you know, we also extend some surveys. Uh, we could develop a variety of things. Is it going to be a checklist document? Is it going to be um, even uh, issue papers that we then take into other bodies that are doing this work, like the OAS or ISO? Um, you know, and could, could, could wind up being many, many different things, but then overall, I would like um, us to be somewhere between the second objective and the third objective by the time we get to the IGF next year, um, so that the guidance is somewhat well formed and we're starting to socialize it and, and getting it into the right hands. Um, I would just fine finish up by saying, I think that there's no stakeholder group in the IGF that shouldn't really care about this. I've thought about this also quite a great deal. I mean, government, I, we're all sort of procurers of technology, as Vouts pointed out. Um, some are more high stakes than others. If you're procuring um, a whole lot of different things for government, you might pay a lot more attention to <laughs> procurement supply chain management strategy um, than, than you would if you're just shopping on Amazon for your own personal equipment. Um, or, you know, for all the schools in Europe or setting standards at that level, right? There are different levels. Um, so governments off should, should certainly care. Private sector has, I think, um, a real stake in this where they're making good products and they want the uptake of those products to be at a, at a wider, more widespread level. Um, the technical community then um, has a great deal of stake in this because they're setting good standards and they want them implemented. And so leap, while perhaps they're not the protocol police, right? They are 
um, they should be paying attention to how demand side is driving the adoption of good protocols, especially when a lot of standards have competing standards that are also standardized, right? So which standards are effectively winning um, uh, matters a lot when you can um, bring in the, the sort of consumer side use case. Um, and then of course, civil society has a great deal um, to, at, at stake here where um, we can get a little bit closer to the end user with this kind of research. I feel like sometimes in the internet governance forum, we have um, a good idea of some public interest um, considerations and end user harms in mind, but it's not very often um, that we are able to take these like very high level norm setting principles and so on and actually reach end users. And like I said, I don't think we're going to be influencing the way people buy their own personal equipment. Um, but I think that we get a lot closer to say, um, you know, workers' rights in a secure um, employment environment and other things like that. So, so it's um, trying to close the gap um, between um, theory standardization and actual demand for these products. Um, and so, you know, academics as well, I'm sure are doing a lot of research on this and that's part of um, the process is to bring in um, learnings from academia um, and, and um, actual measurement and practice into this space so that it allows for better decision-making. So that's my pitch to all of you, irrespective of where you sit in this constellation of internet governance, that this is a worthwhile um, place to actually manage real outcomes. Um, and yeah, just really hope you'll join us in this work. So thanks. Thank you, Mallory. I think uh, you've heard three pitches on potential work in the future and certainly an invitation to join. Um, we come to the cliffhanger because we, I'm going to hand over to Raymond Mamata, who is chair of two working groups, actually. The first is education and skills which Janice presented on, but he's also the chair of Working Group 4 on communication. And Raymond, the floor is yours to uh, present on what, uh, what you've been doing in the past two months. Thank you, um, Walt, for the opportunity and thanks to my preceding speakers. I hope um, my screen is showing. Yes, uh, we see it, Raymond. So working group four is composed of um, a team of people who have passion to ensure that our DC is well represented um, in terms of digital presence and have a professional outlook in what we do. In this regard, we are looking at having a professional email address that we can be using for our communication. We are also looking at getting a website for ourselves and also get our presence felt on our social media handle. We also need to create a very good logo that communicates exactly who we are as a DC. Now our name, our name as a DC, because we belong to the dynamic collation, we, uh, is the dynamic collation on internet standard security and safety. But we've taken into consideration concerns of um, our various stakeholders and members, and we, are converting our name from the dynamic collision on internet standards, security and safety to internet standards, security and safety collision, which will be shortened as IS3C. So this will be our new name to be referred to from um, today. Our logo, this is our logo. We never had a logo. So we are unveiling our logo today. This is how it looks. Um, to give an overview of the logo, the first option has a globe. Next to the globe is a lock. 
to the globe represent the internet and the lock represents security. The globe also represents our presence uh, all over the, the world. And we have our full name on the logo, which is the Internet Standard Security and Safety. The logo also has our acronym IS3C and also has our slogan, what we are noted for. So our slogan is making the internet more secure and safer. So this is our logo that we are unveiling today. So the way forward, the way forward for us as a working group for on behalf of the DC is to create social media handles so that we can have our digital presence felt. We'll create our own um, website so that we wouldn't be relying on the IGF um, SAP website supporter that has been given to us. We'll also be having official email addresses for all the leaders so that they will stop using their Yahoo Gmail and the rest. So we'll have our own professional email addresses for our leaders to be using. We also want to get people who have skills in graphic design and social media and the passion for this to join the um, working group and the DC in general. So to join the DC, you just um, need to go to the address here, it will be posted in the chat. You just click on it, then you can join the mailing list. You just have to provide your email addresses and click and you automatically join the mailing list. If you also want to get more information on what we do, our various leaders and our activities so far, you can also go to the other link down there to get further information on what um, the DC is all about. The DC's communication team is um, being sponsored by e-governance and internet governance foundation for Africa, which is a civil society in Accra, Ghana, which I am the founder and the president. Thank you very much. If any question, we are open for that. Thank you very much, Raymond, and also for your excellent work on chairing this working group and making sure that we all agreed on what's just been diverse to you, because we have a new name, we have a logo, and we will have our own website, etc. very soon from now. From now, I give the floor to my partner in crime, Mark Ravel. He's the senior policy advisor for the Dynamic Coalition, which I should now say the Internet Standards Security and Safety Coalition. And he will tell a little bit about the governance of this Dynamic Coalition. And after that, a little bit of the outreach that we've been doing in the past 12 months. And the governance we'd like to report on because when we started last year, we got a lot of questions about decision making, etc. And Mark will explain a little bit about what we did to answer these questions. So, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Vout, and um, greetings, everybody. Uh, just to enhance the geography here, I'm in the UK, so in Europe, not in the EU anymore, but. Uh, uh, anyway, um, that's another issue, <laughs> which I dare not go anywhere near. Um, my background is uh, I was with the UK government um, uh, for 10 years, leading on internet uh, governance policy, and uh, I uh, represented the UK in Council of Europe, Steering Committee on Media and Information Society, and uh, at ICANN in the, in the UK seat on Governmental Advisory Committee and uh, also led negotiations on digital in the G7 for two years in Japan and uh, Italy. And um, so uh, I, uh, I left the government service and uh, I joined uh, IS3C uh, uh, in the early days with Vout, really to set it up. And, and as Vout said, it's our anniversary. So it's great, we've, we've, we've come a long way from the conceptualization and uh, uh, the launch uh, last uh, uh, year, year ago at the IGF last year, and um, 
uh, we've had lots of support and our launch, we had a support from the, the Swiss government. So you've, you've seen the architecture of, of the coalition shown here with uh, three working groups on uh, focused issues in a first phase of work and uh, Raymond's uh, work in, uh, in the fourth working group on our communication strategy and how we are uh, presenting our profile and so on. And uh, so we, we've, we've got an architecture pretty well established now in our first year and we've got uh, three working groups actively up and running. In the early days we had to think about, well, we're ambitious, we want to be uh, an outcome orientated dynamic coalition, uh, very much in the spirit of the reform of the IGF, the IGF plus proposals that have come out of the roadmap on digital cooperation. And uh, we, uh, we thought in the early days, well, you know, for the coalition to achieve the kind of impacts that Mallory was um, uh, describing, we've got to ensure that we have a coherent, robust process that will uh, ensure that our outcomes are authoritative and respected. So we turned to the uh, issue of you know, how do we provide that um, in, in establishing a governance framework for, for the coalition. Um, so we consulted with the people who were with us in those early stages of the coalition and we decided to come up with a, a, a governance uh, framework and a, specifically a document that would set out some key uh, principles of working and uh, mechanisms in particular with regard to reaching decisions uh, and uh, uh, pr the process of taking those decisions forward uh, to endorse outcomes before we go out to the whole world with our, uh, our guidelines, our policy recommendations to, to governments and, and to private sector leaders, uh, decision takers in the private sector, our toolkits or whatever it is, the kind of things that Mallory was, was envisioning uh, as a kind of roster of outcomes. How do we get to those uh, points of, of, of delivery? And uh, so we drew up a, a, a governance document. It's on, on the website, following a lot of discussion and, and, and consultation and checking practice elsewhere and so on. Um, but we started with pretty much with a, with a, uh, a blank sheet. Um, and it covers uh, some key aspects. First of all, membership. Who is a member of this coalition? And uh, we decided that uh, basically it was pretty difficult to uh, define it other than who was actively subscribing to our mail list because people will quite often follow our work uh, as, as uh, subscribers to the mail list but not actually engage in, in, in the uh, working groups. But then again, they might do and, and they would have that option. Uh, and maybe they're sort of you know, assessing the progress of the work before deciding to commit time as volunteers in working groups. So we decided to sub, uh, designate membership to anybody who was on the, uh, on the subscription list um, for uh, the mail list. And then uh, how do we reach decisions based on, we decided to form, follow really practice elsewhere. And I know this from my work at ICANN of, of basis of con consensus where there's no objection. Uh, and uh, we've set that out uh, clearly in the uh, governance uh, document. And then the process for reaching decisions, it's bottom up, it's multi-stakeholder. This is very much in line with uh, principles of uh, endorsed by, by the WISIS uh, for the IGF and so on. So it, the, the process will come up from the working groups and then go to the leadership, the coordinator ultimately, uh, about to Natris. Um, and then, uh, the, the proposals would be um, put to the full membership for, for agreement before then going out to a wider, totally open consultation for any stakeholder anywhere to, uh, to give their views. So we, we set this out in a kind of clearly set, uh, clearly set process and also how to deal with, well, what happens if not everybody agrees? How do we, how do we resolve that in the kind of process for revising a proposal or 
in the worst case, hopefully it will never happen, we just say we couldn't reach agreement. So anyway, that's in the, in the governance uh, document. Um, and uh, this is not a document that's uh, set in stone. We envisage it, re reviewing it, seeing how effective it is, how we gain experience after our first year. And uh, it's a kind of iterative process, if you like, for sustaining an effective governance uh, framework for the work of the group, for the work of the coalition, that, as I say, would command respect and from the wider stakeholder community, from people in government, ministers, whoever we want to get uh, engaged on our outcomes. That, that's the key objective. Uh, also, uh, I should underline, it's fully transparent. All our work is transparent. People can follow and us and, and our, our documentations and tra transparent and all that is clearly stated in the governance framework as well. Okay, I'll stop there. I, I hope I've kept to my uh, precious five minutes. I don't know. I haven't been following the uh, clock. Yes, you went over about 40 seconds, Mark. So okay. thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm giving the word to you back right away because the, you were going to do a little bit on our outreach and do an update there. So four and a half minutes. <laughs> oh, you're a tough coordinator. You are. <laughs> okay. A uh, moderator. Uh, <laughs> uh, quite right. Got to have some sort of. Uh, discipline and uh, uh, be robust in all our approach. Well, outreach, what are, why, what, is the, what are the goals of our outreach? Obviously, it's important for us as a multi-stakeholder process to promote awareness and the opportunity for people to join us. And of course, we need uh, experts, uh, uh, we need their inputs and uh, we need to, they need to know that we exist and what we're doing and what our aims are and what our prospective outcomes will be. So awareness raising is a key thing. Getting the participation of experts, uh, stakeholders to join us is, is a key goal for the outreach uh, in, um, uh, objectives. Thirdly, to, to engage people who would help us with our strategic thinking. Uh, you know, we're, we're in it for the, the long term. We're not going to be into this whole area, this complex area of cybersecurity, and then out again quickly. We, we, we're phasing our work, so we need some um, insights and views on how to strategize our approach to the work as we, you know, we've got three working groups now, we may well uh, set up a further ones next year and then, you know, as we progress through aspects of the whole issue of standards deployment and addressing the gap uh, between development and deployment of standards. Um, fundraising, that's another key objective for our, our um outreach we do as as the working group chairs have described we we've got interview processes we've got research projects being formulated that's going to need funding uh, and we need to cover some of our essential administrative costs so outreach to uh, to uh, source uh, funding uh, requirements and i spoke about this in the um, in the session earlier in the igf this week about dynamic coalitions and we're we're going to talk to uh, uh, Jason Munyon in, uh, in the Tech Envoy's office about this whole issue of funding for dynamic coalitions, along with other coalitions that are in the same, facing the same challenge. Um, and, uh, and also a final um, aspect of outreach is that uh, we're, we're conscious we can contribute to capacity building and, and talking to people about what our coalition can do in terms of providing inputs into capacity building initiatives. And we've got uh, discussions coming up about that. So who are we talking to? Um, well, within the IGF community, of course, we've got the, the session here today and uh, we've contributed to the Our Digital Future program. Uh, the first session on that back in September about cybersecurity, we took part in that alongside the best practice forum on cybersecurity. And that's an example of how we are complementing uh, the work we do with with the best practice uh, forum on, on cybersecurity. We're talking to the UN, uh, of course, the Tech Envoy's office, and we talk to the to the European Union, DG Connect. We we are talking to other international, um, multilateral and multi stakeholder organisations like the OAS, the OAS, the uh, African Union, um, and standards platforms like the EU one uh, on on standards. Um, we, uh, we have um, 
spoken in, in providing public presentations, if you like, um, at the Asia Pacific Regional IGF. We're very grateful for, for the uh, steering committee of the APR IGF in affording us a time at their last uh, big event. Um, and also UADIG. Um, and uh, we have an opportunity coming up uh, next week with the uh, open ended working group of the UN. Uh, we've, we've secured a slot in that, as has the best practice forum, I note as well. Um, so the IGF's work on cybersecurity, we're going to be there explaining what we're doing to the, the, uh, the, the UN process uh, of the OEWG, which is opening up a lot more now to stakeholder participation, so that's great news. And we're talking to national IGFs uh, on Saturday, actually, with, we, uh, about and I are speaking at the uh, Taiwan uh, IGF. Uh, we're looking for other opportunities. Uh, and next year, well, we need we need you know, we need to geographically spread out a lot more. Uh, it was great that uh, India has now launched its national IGF, the IIGF, uh, just held. Uh, hopefully, next year we can get a slot there because South Asia is so important, and also Africa, the African uh, Internet uh, Summit, the African IGF, and Afrinic. We're hoping that we secure opportunities there. Um, so uh, that's that's our uh, approach. Uh, we need to reach out to all regions. Back here at the IGF, we've got a networking uh, session tomorrow at uh, 11.30 to 12.30 UTC. Please talk to us there. We need feedback from everybody and uh, uh, help us uh, to uh, spread the word and connect into more and more. Net it's like the internet, you know, it's a network of networks. The IGF affords that. We need to connect into other networks of stakeholders. Back to you about, I don't know if that was four and a half minutes or whatever. But... <laughs> okay, it is relevant information, Mark. So the, thank you very much for that. Um, I think it's time to, to open the floor. I saw the chat uh, appearing in front of me, but I could not read it, the, the small letters. Uh, could you look at it, Mark, as remote moderator, if there are any questions there? And from there, I'll turn to the room here if there are any questions, but let's give the people who are online and there are, this is a hybrid IGF, the chance to ask a question first. Are you hearing me, Mark? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just going through the chat. Actually. Okay, no, okay, good. I, I thought, I thought so, but monitor the chat at the same time. Sorry. Um, no, don't worry, but we were seeing a, a, a dark screen here all of a sudden. So oh, okay. just checking. Okay. I'm still here. Um, well, uh, I I don't see any questions jump out. Um, there was Aaron Butler was asking about uh, the link uh, that I think uh, Janice referred to, which I think is the main main. Um, uh, uh, website page for the uh, coalition. So we've provided that. Um, I'm just scrolling down. Um, Otherwise, I'll look in the no, room. Other than congratulations and uh, okay. <laughs> our name, I think, is has been well received. Our new name um, and, uh, and the acronym IS3C. So much easier to say. <laughs> Okay, thank you for that. I'm looking at the room. Is there any any questions? Yes, Joao. And, and first, introduce yourself, please. There's a mic there. My introduction will be a little bigger than the usual because you get it. <laughs> so, hello. My name is Joao Falcon. I work with cybersecurity, meaning that I am a white hat hat hacker. Oh, uh, in here I am representing my company in Teleway. Uh, my commentary will be directed to Janice. First, thank you for your work. We need more people joining forces in this subject. Uh, I would like to state that my company agrees with you and understands there is a huge lack of knowledge on what cyber a cybersecurity professional uh, needs to know uh, we believe that the knowledge about cybersecurity isn't proper integrated in formal education. So my company decided to create uh, 
a partnership with one Brazilian university. I am from Brazil. Uh, with this partnership, uh, we are creating a program to professionalize students uh, with classes, uh, tutoring and internships directed to cybersecurity and uh, artificial intelligence. So our idea is to teach hard skills at the same time we strengthen the soft skills uh, needed to the job. So uh, my question is about this kind of partnership are being considered in the cyber secure in your work. Thank you. Yes, so definitely we need these partnerships. We do have a partnership with the university in Poland, but until we get partnerships with organizations like your own, we can't have that glue that's going to bring all of the knowledge together. I myself am working with Morocco also where they, well, we all have the same problem. So we're looking for your partnership please come and join us and uh, we can also show you what we want with the interviews get you to conduct interviews this has to be a collegial job and it's great work you're doing obviously so thank you thank you and then i'm going to, after here in the room there will be next question and mark uh, if there are any questions online then of course the floor is theirs uh, and being outside of this room please introduce yourself first thanks uh, i'm martina i'm a researcher a postdoctoral researcher at uh, the european university institute and i also since six years uh, do on my free time uh, teaching of skilling skills for kids and uh, teenagers to try to make them creative thinkers and uh, try to stimulate this kind of uh, new uh, soft skills that you were talking about. And I just wanted to uh, add a comment on what you were saying, because uh, you, you were saying that you're focusing on tertiary education and you were talking about uh, soft skills. Uh, but um, if you look at like at pedagogy research, a lot of the soft skills have to be taught in secondary school or even primary school. So I just wanted to encourage you to, to take into account the fact that uh, a lot of the skills uh, can be and, and like knowledge and competences can be taught in university. But if you really want to change and uh, make sure that our like the next generation is empowered to take part in this uh, revolution, digital revolution, we really have to start much earlier. And this is much harder, of course, but it requires collaboration with the local authorities and national authorities, but it can be done. And we are now that doing a, a big uh, randomized control trial to try to study the impact of certain type of uh, courses on 3D printing, coding in school, and see how they impact the creativity, greed, and this new type of uh, competences which are required for well, young people to engage in uh, STEM education, in STEM uh, subjects, and of course, uh, cybersecurity then comes uh, after as a specialization. I just went for this. Thanks. Thank you very much for bringing this up. In fact, I do wear a number of hats. And I did begin my career many, many years ago as a primary school teacher. Um, I fully agree with you. I am working with the Council of Europe. I'm also in the process of writing uh, for UNESCO, the teacher training curriculum on global citizenship. And I fully agree. Some of the skills that I mentioned, simply you can't jump uh, until you're 17 years old and, and say, I'm going to be developing that holistic thinking, that critical thinking, uh, uh, the ability to forecast, for example, they need to start very early. So that's why I didn't speak about it, because we are more focusing at the vocational level right now. Uh, but we would be very happy to work with you if you could please Give me your details so that we can stay in contact. And you're definitely right. We need to work together and we need to make sure that young people emerge from their school education ready to take on this vocational education. Yes, and I can only add to it, it was an excellent comment. And we had very serious discussions about the scoping 
of this working group and decided to limit it at first, but that the, as I said, there are these little open boxes for the future where if, as soon as this is more, more or less taken care of could be added to. So that is something which the, as, as also Mark said, in 2022, 23, we will be opening new workshops. Is there a comment online, Mark? We will see the chat moving. Um, no, there were just really comments about access uh, to recording. Um, Awo had a problem following us. Um, so it is on YouTube, of course, so it can be picked up there, as uh, Ying Chu helpfully pointed out. Yes, and um, there, will be, there will be a link online uh, very soon after this session is over yeah. and when it's processed. Right. Um, and okay. then, of course, as I say, we've got the networking tomorrow. So please, if anybody's thinking, you know, think of your questions and, and grill us tomorrow. <laughs> this is your chance to say you're, you're focusing on the right things or maybe, you know, if you're thinking we should be prioritizing on other things, this is what we all need to know. Um, and also yeah. ask questions about everything that we're doing now as we're progressing through our work plan now, as, as you've heard from the, the working group chairs. Sorry, so so if, if you're online, please put up your hands because Mark monitored for us and you can ask your questions uh, just like people in the room. But now I have Vittorio. Uh, I was going to ask you a question also, Vittorio, because you work in this industry and perhaps you could, uh, next to your question or comment, also comment on, do you think that we are working in the right direction as Mark, as Mark was saying? So please, Vittorio. Yes, that, that's also the question I wanted to make to you. Do we think that we as an industry are working in the right direction? But, well, first, with no offense to anyone, I, I, but just to point out how hard this is, let me point out the, the weirdness of being here and discussing about a secure and safer internet in a conference which has just been Zoom bombed uh, like one hour ago in a, in a very simple way, like if it were in, uh, just the average meeting of people that never used Zoom in their life. And this is just to show that it's very easy in, in this field to say that we need more security, we should do this, we should do that. It's very hard to do it because then when you need, I mean, you have to give up stuff to be secure. You have to be uncomfortable sort of time. I mean, do something which is inconvenient, but it would be so convenient to share all the Zoom links to all the sessions in a spreadsheet on your website. But then what you get is that you get Zoom bombed. So th this is also what I wanted to point out because at this, at this level, at the UN level, of course, this discussion is, at a very high level, inevitably. But on the other hand, as you've seen on the field, you need something very specific. And, and even when the industry tries to do this, it gets into the same issues. I mean, as a company, we, we are a big email, email vendor. We've been for years sponsoring a, a project in which I was going around the world and telling to ISPs around the world that they need to deploy these technologies, encryption and the NSEC and DANE and all the technologies to make email secure. And we were co-sponsored by other email vendors. And like five years later, we, we still cannot deploy Dane at one of our customers because one of the email vendors that were sponsoring the project still has not implemented Dane in the, in the platform and has no clear delivery date for that. And the basic issue is that there is no demand for this. So in this room, we agree that this is necessary, but the, the end customers don't buy internet products because of the deployment of uh, encryption. I mean, there are some very few specialized uh, providers that give you encryption, they are niche providers. But if you go to the mass providers, people choose them by, by the price, they choose them by the nice advertising, by the branding, by the marketing channels. So they find them at the supermarket, they find the box, they buy it. So this is why there is no demand for this. This is the real problem. And so I was wondering whether you, we could at least agree on what's the best point of pressure. So is it regulation? So since the industry is not going to do this because there is no market or business demand, not a priority business demand, then maybe we need to force the industry to do this by regulation. Or it's the industry themselves, so maybe just by educating. I mean, in my experience, this is not really going to work very well. There are a few companies that really care. Or is the users, maybe we can create this demand, but I also think it's not. Uh, so I don't know if you've, I mean, through this discussion, you come to some consensus and advice on what we could do, maybe we, even with very targeted, I mean, by, by sector, by protocol, even <laughs> efforts. Uh, I mean, so, some parts of the industry would be willing to fund that and work on that, but uh, we need to agree on what's the real point of pressure to make this happen. Yes, uh, th thank you all. Give Mallory the, the, the word as well, I think, in, in your response. The, 
the thing that we started with basically is that we identified in the, the report that was the basis for this dynamic coalition, where are the pressure points in society on, on creating a safer environment? And yes, the first one that came out simply was regulated. But also everybody, nearly 100% nearly is the bad, really the baddest idea that you can think of to do because you will have 200 different sets of regulation in the world. So don't go that way. And we are going to look at the positive pressure points and some negative pressure points. The positive ones, if we can convince governments and large corporations to buy secure by design, then you create the business case because the rest will not get accepted. There are more negative pressure points and then you have to think about consumer regulation perhaps that already exists or consumer testing uh, advocacy agencies that test the products. It could well be that we have to look at, at um, testing the products themselves. The bad guys are testing 24 hours a day. So why aren't the good guys? So why don't we organize a mechanism around the world that we pay people to actually hack products and when we put that on the doorstep of the manufacturer that's going to be the moment that he's going to feel extremely uncomfortable because everybody will know at some point that it is insecure products so that is a positive way a stimulus incentive by procurement so that's the working group but the blank spaces that we have are talking with consumer regulatory privacy regulatory bodies, what do they have in their law? And that are things that we are starting to discuss and hopefully will lead to a new working group where it, at least it will be researched. They're not gonna go into action, but perhaps they will are willing to research it themselves and have a working group on it. So that's the sort of topic we are looking at. Is that the answer? Because that's what we need to agree on. And I'll come back to a, perhaps an, an easy outcome for this year in the end of my summary of the meeting. But first, Mallory, do you, you still have your own mic, right? Do I? I do. Yes. Does it work? It does. Um, this is not representing any um, of the hats I wear. This is my own personal opinion. I um, derive a great deal of joy from um, disrupting uh, snake oil. And I think something that companies and governments and a lot of us have to spend money on is um, sort of the cybersecurity industry, right? Like you go to these big conferences and they're selling you like antivirus and it's very, I mean, you know, you've got controversial advertising of like women and scantily dressed things on top of cars. I mean, it's a disaster. It's such a mess. And I think that whole cybersecurity industry is um, an embarrassment to you know, the internet now. I think this is an opportunity potentially to get in the way of that. So rather than um, you know, spending loads of money on these sort of damage control products um, and insurance and all of that, maybe just like harm reduce, maybe some harm reduction. I think that's what this is. This is a more measured approach to like, maybe when you buy things or when you are implementing technology, you just check a couple boxes before you sign like a really big contract. That's it. And then potentially that will save you money um, in the long term because you're not having to invest in these sort of, um, you know, sexy looking solutions that really just are very expensive. Um, and they don't really do much other than just like they promise to protect you, right? So um, I, I think that we have an opportunity to maybe be that, um, you know, which is maybe not very, it's kind of boring, but actually it could be really fun because I think there are a lot of us that are in this industry that really despise that sort of like glitzy, but like vapid approach to, to cybersecurity. So I'd like to think that this is making the case for maybe just like do it right the first time. Um, so we'll see, maybe that'll work, maybe it won't. I think that move from mitigation to prevention. I think that that's a good second slogan, perhaps. But thank you for your question, Vittorio, because it's spot on. Look at you, Savio or Janice, if you'd like to respond to some the comments made. Uh, yes, I did, because I think one very important pressure point is employment. 
And as we've seen over the past year or two with the, the pirating, the hacks in, in national systems, uh, everyone is aware now that we really need to increase cybersecurity. A few years back when I was doing some work with Kaspersky and we realized there was a gap, uh, they came in contact with the Dublin government, well, the local government in Dublin, and actually set up a whole training course, which is running extremely well, but it's also been replicated in several countries. So for me, the fact that this is a, a growing area of employment, uh, it, it's a very important pressure point that we need to use. Yes, and, and Victoria, you're one of our members on the, on the list. Perhaps we should just have a one-on-one -on -one with a few of us as well to see how we could progress in the direction that you're suggesting because it's a very sound suggestion and actually one we want to work on so thank you i'm looking more back to mark as a question on your end because we're running towards the end of our session uh no nothing in the chat i don't see any um hands raised um no um i think we've um uh, covered a lot of ground and maybe people are digesting what we've presented okay uh, and and I, as i said in the chat actually please come back to us tomorrow at the networking session which is a All very right. open opportunity thank you very much thank you very much uh yeah. i'm going to ask the final comments from you nicholas because i know you have some ideas on how we could go forward so the, the mic is there and you can have a couple of minutes to explain what you would like to do in the working group one, I understand. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Nicolas Giomarelli, co-founder of the IoT cybersecurity in Latin America and the Caribbean. Well, uh, from my point of view or our point of view, we think that the, the work of the DC is very enormous and it's a big challenge uh, for every one of, of us to, to be involved in, in this kind of issues because we know that the industry is behind the security protocols of, of several uh, uh, standardization uh, parties. So uh, at the end, I, I just have a, a little comment uh, uh, related with the, with the question from Vittorio that I think as, as the electronic devices has this uh, sticker for, for the energy efficiency, maybe you, you could have at your home some the calefactors or, or these artifacts, uh, the air conditioners also have, for example, A plus uh, for, uh, uh, sticker that say you that that is uh, energy efficient in some manner. Uh, there, there exists some uh, standardization from the OTA framework, for example, that, that could tell you that, that the device is secure at some manner, that uh, when your data is going, which type of data is. So the consumer from the consumer protection uh, point of view uh, could know also which device the, he is uh, buying. So this is another uh, leg that, that was not mentioned in, in, in this workshop. And, and I think it's, it's another part of, of the thing that we need to look at. Uh, and from the IoT, CyberSec, Latin America uh, and Caribbean, we started our activity in April in, in 2021 this year uh, in trying to, to do like a mapping of public policies around the world also, but uh, focusing on Latin America and Caribbean, what the governments, what the regulators are doing in, in each of the countries. That is uh, a thing that we think is, could be very interesting to find some patterns or common patterns in in countries to look at the, at the better way the, that, that they need to be followed. And also we, we are trying to do like a, a survey of all the different protocols in, in terms of the IoT security uh, in particular uh, from different standardization bodies. So we are now uh, uh, trying to, to reach out more with the, with the work of the DC. So very glad to be here and, and to try to help <laughs> for the same aim we all have. Thank you. Savio, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, adding a bit more about the, the, the topics about the, the, uh, the work of, of Working Group 1 uh, in, in cybersecurity by design for IoT, more specifically. Uh, one, one point of statement for us uh, is also gluing all the things. Uh, 
taking advantage of the of the phrase for the youth summit uh we need more uh, less conversation and more uh, actions so we we have people saying things everywhere i, I mean we have uh icon saying things about dns and iot we have itf uh, having new standards we have always talking about best practices but there is no uh, we still some some someone to glue the thing up so this is the the, the action that we have the aim in the working group one, one like uh, get all these things that every, everyone uh, is saying about uh, IoT security, uh, understand the aims of everyone and glue the thing up to have uh, practical actions uh, for a, a safer and more secure Internet of Things. Uh, thank you, Savio. And um, we're running under five minutes, so we're Ooh. wrapping up. Yes, Yuri. Yes. <laughs> Thank Please. you. Uh, I uh, I would add that the, that uh, very uh, strange and paradoxical fact, but uh, we must um, find the answer to the question: Where does safety begins? And what determines the security and safety? Is it a relation? between user and services is it relations between uh gadget and users gadget and services i think that uh, answers on this question is open yet and we uh, should find the answer on these questions Thank you. I think you've met, put a giant challenge in front of us, but it's almost philosophical, I think. But <laughs> I think the question it's is... practical, not sophistical. <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds philosophical, let me put it like that. But I, I know that it's very, in the end, it's very practical, Yuri. You're totally, so totally, totally it's, right. It's, it's, it's basic point of our research. Yes. And, but, and uh, Olivier has Yes, raised... Mark. About Olivier has raised his hand. Okay, uh, Olivier, the, then you have the final word from, from the floor. Thank you very much, Vals. I, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it should be the final word, but okay. Um, yeah, very interesting discussion. And, and uh, some of you might not be aware, but in recent times, I've been evolving in the uh, app, uh, mobile application and uh, venture capital uh, side of things, trying to get funding for an app that I'm developing. And one of the things that has horrified me is uh, being parts of some pitch contests and, and pitch discussions and so on, hearing the pitches that never actually touch about the societal component of what their product is going to have uh, on, you know, the, so the people design things, companies come up with new services and so on. They're not really interested at all in whether it's legal, not legal, whether there's regulation around it, whether there will be regulation around it. They're just thinking we need to make money. And the second thing that the that has horrified me is that uh, uh, anything to do with the security of what they're building and cybersecurity of it is also just a sidetrack. There's more interest in how much return can we make in the next two years? Is it five times, ten, ten times the initial investment? And that's it. And this is a real problem because what we see then is innovation doesn't look at these issues of cybersecurity and issues of stability and of the impact that it will have. And um, I, I think that we've got a, a lot of work to do on this one, because unless this is done, this is where things are moving always, the innovation, the, the edge, unless we deal with that from the beginning, then we've got a real problem. Yes, and I think your observation is totally right, uh, Olivier. Thank you for that, because the, the, I think it was the same with cars when they started, and at some point it changed, and with airplanes it changed as well. And we maybe have to look at the development of all sorts of applications in the near future in the same sort of way. Um, the screen is turning orange now, so I'm going to close the mics and just go into my few final summary. I need my unfortunately nowadays need my glasses for that um but to sum up i think we've heard 
the 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 ambition that this dynamic coalition has and and the, the way we want to progress and i want to thank my the presenters for stating very clearly where they want to go in 2022 and i think that we could also perhaps produce two overall sort of goals what i what i call my top 20 and that is uh, not necessarily 20 different uh, standards but what are the most urgent standards that if governments and organizations started deploying them would already secure the world significantly and that they because they are limited makes them also more compre comprehensible and handleable for the people who have to learn to work with them because most of them are not technically technically ed educated they're economically or financially educated or sales educated etc and they will really need to learn that it's a true component of their work this cyber security because our society depends on it another one could be an inventory of what is out there so what sort of standards do we have what exactly is it that it means or does and who is addressed who is the organization needing to take action because an inventory like that would already make a major impact because you can refer to it people cannot say any longer we didn't know that this exists if this is a list that is presented everywhere i think that we as mark already ex explained that we need support as a dynamic coalition in several ways we need support from experts willing to work with us look at the research that we're doing or do the research but look at the, re the research is this the right direction is this exactly the answers that we as a stakeholder community need so that is the sort of experts that we're looking for we need experts and people who are willing to open doors for us who are in a position to say i can introduce you to this stakeholder community or i'm willing to present or let you present or let you write something in our newsletters or introduce us to people and we need financial support and with that i can th thank a few organizations today already as mark mentioned the swiss foreign office helped us establish ourselves last year we got a substantial funding from sidn in the netherlands the dot nl domain organization we had funding from uh from microsoft to do some preliminary research in working group one we've been funded by the platform internet standards in the netherlands who helped us give some presentations around the world we are going to be assisted which has not been mentioned yet by ecp the organization behind the nl igf the dutch national igf who is going to run our financial side so it will not be money made to me as a as a consultant but to an organization where everybody gets invoices from or can send their invoice to and and finally we've got, had support from a as as raymond was presenting on but they, they will be financing our domain name our website email system etc and they are from ghana and finally the you know the the igf secretariat helped us with all the things around this session of course so that is a thank you for for the support we have changed our name, as you can see. We, we are no longer known as a dynamic coalition, but as Internet Standards Security and Safety Coalition. And that is to, to, to set us a little bit more apart from the IGF, but of course we will be functioning within the IGF system as a dynamic coalition. So that definitely does not change. And finally, is that, uh, as Mark said, we'll be reaching out to a lot of organizations, and that's what I've been using the past four days for and tomorrow as well we're having numerous meetings with organizations who are able to open doors and perhaps finance us in the in in the future and some of them have indicated that we can put send a proposal to them so that is the 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 strength of the igf because people come together here and they are and not everybody was able to come due to the pandemic or due to fears of of getting COVID or for other reasons but the fact is that we are here and that made me extremely happy because we we were able to come and meet face to face discuss all these important topics with each other not just this one but all the others and i think that we're showing the strength of the igf once again so with that 
I'm going to close. I'm four minutes out of time, but it's all Mark's fault, as you saw, because he went over time in his presentation, Mark. <laughs> but yeah, I want, want to thank you all who were online present and for your, your input in the chat and your uh, congratulations on our work and on our new name. Thank you again for, for presenting. Yuri also for presenting from, from Ukraine, from Odessa. Thank you for your questions and I wish you a very pleasant evening, a good final day of the IGF and I hope that we meet each other again soon and don't forget to sign up to our membership list and become engaged because the work that we are doing is try really trying to make a difference. And that is, uh, I think, something very worthwhile. So have a very good day. Thank you also for facilitating everything behind the desk there. And with us, I wish you a pleasant evening. Bye-bye.